truths you didn't know, but secretly suspected. Every month I get asked, what do you believe in? And by that I mean, what other conspiracies have caught your interest? I'd like to first qualify my answers with a few things. To start, I'd like to state for the record that I have always loved my home country of America. This place has allowed me to do some amazing things over the years. The United States is truly great. It is, however, not without its flaws. There are several 800-pound gorillas in the room, and they need to be addressed. Is the U.S. the greatest empire that ever was? No. It is the Michael Jordan of empires. It's flashy, and it puts on a great show, but it is not the greatest empire. People cheered Jordan as he entered their arena because he was the greatest showman in the history of basketball. The greatest player was Wilt Chamberlain, and he was booed when he entered the arena because you could not stop him. He averaged 50 points a game, every night, and there was nothing you could do about it. The Wilt Chamberlain of our civilization was, of course, the Roman Empire. They weren't better than the United States because they conquered for a thousand years. They were better because they were transparent with the people. The general public expected them to conquer, and they were proud of it. They expected domination, and they got it, time and time again. America does some very controversial things for the Empire, but paints a different picture for the people keeping them somewhat innocent, and in doing so, creates interesting webs of conspiracies. We are the good guys, but we are founded on a series of wars that have guided its fate for almost 250 years. I'm going to rattle off as many of the relevant truths as I can related to how we became the greatest show on Flat Earth. None of them are secret, and I'll try to keep most to under a paragraph. America didn't win its freedom because the colonists kicked out the British. It was just another part of a long-time rivalry between England and France. After the British left, the first time, France sold us most of the United States. It was called the Louisiana Purchase. The British-French War continued in Europe until Napoleon finally lost at Waterloo and the British tried to take America back a second time in the War of 1812 hitting the southern coast and finally losing at the Battle of New Orleans. It's why Andrew Jackson is on the $20 bill. A short time later, the U.S. sacrificed Fort Alamo to the Mexican army, killing several hundred people, including Jim Bowie and Davy Crockett. Yes, he was a real guy, not just something created by Disney. It started the Mexican-American War, or what I call the greatest land grab ever. Not sending reinforcements and letting the Alamo burn to the ground got us Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California. One of the big reasons we have an immigration problem is, well, they used to live here. Right after the dust settled on that, England tried to take the U.S. a third and final time in what is now known as the American Civil War. Oh, you thought that whole blue and gray brother versus brother thing was about slavery? Think again. Where do you think the South got all of its weapons? Most of the Southern Navy were ships built in England. They had advisors everywhere. And the plan was perfect. Aid the South, let the two sides battle it out, then take back everything. Would have worked, too, until Lincoln asked Russia to keep England out of the fight. And they did. The South lost in five years. Have your doubts? Look up the ship called the CSS Alabama. That thread will keep you going for a while. The U.S. had to rebuild for a few decades, but then went right back to expanding the empire. It blew up its own battleship, the Maine, blamed Spain, and then took Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. The war hero, Teddy Roosevelt, then became president, and they put him on Mount Rushmore, if you were wondering who the guy with the glasses was. World War I was just a restructuring of Europe. World War II was another country being better at empire building than we were. 
I'll keep this one very short. Like the Alamo and the Maine, we sacrificed Pearl Harbor and a day later a million Americans signed up for military service. If we didn't sacrifice Pearl Harbor, everyone would be speaking German right now, period. Korea was right after that, more years of fighting over geographic resources. Vietnam was more empire, with some drugs thrown in for good measure. We also learned that wars are best fought out of the jungle. JFK happened in the middle of that, and it was pretty cut and dry for me. A lone gunman defeats the entire Dallas police force and Secret Service, lands multiple headshots in the President of the United States in broad daylight, and gets away only to be caught later because he didn't pay for a movie ticket? I could not make that up. He then is himself killed by another lone gunman who got past Dallas Police and Secret Service. A lone gunman killed by a lone gunman. Talk about against the odds. That's like having a unicorn getting struck by lightning. If you believe that at face value, then I have a few bridges to sell you. Why kill JFK? Simple. He was a pain in the ass to the true powers that be, and he was going to be re-elected. And his brother RFK was coming up right behind him. 16 straight years of the Kennedys in office? <laughs> Not a chance. The last president with any true independent power was Dwight Eisenhower, and that was only because he was a five-star general with military connections. Don't forget that during the Vietnam timeline, we also snuck in the entire Apollo program. If you've ever listened to this show before, you know my take on that. The greatest con the U.S. ever pulled off, convincing the rest of the world that we were so great, we put men on the moon. And the world in turn didn't even bother to go there themselves to confirm it? After Vietnam and Kennedy, the U.S. ran out of places to expand militarily. So again, a few more decades of restructuring and rebranding. Also, you know, some space shuttles that didn't go anywhere, and grainy movies of astronauts that no one cared about because, well, it was the 80s, and everyone was having too good of a time. The Kuwait War was the beginning of the U.S. securing as many oil fields as possible, and then came 9-11. We convinced the American public that a ragtag Middle Eastern group had bypassed all civilian and state-of-the-art military defense systems, including all CIA programs, and had attacked our two most high-profile cities simultaneously using $3 box cutters. Imagine that. The two biggest buildings in America and the Pentagon successfully attacked without the aggressors firing a shot. Oh wait, what happened to Building 7 again? Never mind that it wasn't hit by a plane or debris, or that a British television team reported that it collapsed on live TV 20 minutes before it actually collapsed. There's nothing to see here, right? What did we get for all that bad theater? Every oil well in Iraq, for starters. We also reinforced our position in Saudi Arabia and then set up shop in Afghanistan, which has become the largest heroin producer in the world. Remember the war on drugs? Yeah, we won that years ago. And by won, I mean the US just took it over. Turns out we couldn't get people to stop using drugs. So the US government stepped in and now maintains quality control, distribution, and even some of the manufacturing. If you are buying a street drug in 2020 that isn't marijuana, there's a pretty good chance that CIA's fingerprints are on it. It's too bad that Colombia doesn't have a large oil field because otherwise we'd have boots on the ground there as well. Controlling the petroleum and the cocaine. Eh, you work with what you have, I guess. And that is the short version of American history you're not going to hear about. We are the hero and everyone else is either the villain, a victim, or an innocent bystander. Do I believe in flying saucers? Yes. But not because I watched the first nine seasons of Ancient Aliens, and not because I was the only person to watch the TV movie Roswell with Martin Sheen, and not because I sat under the stars in Colorado for years with night vision binoculars watching them buzz overhead with their lights off. It's because I read the wiki entry on the 1561 Nuremberg event. An entire armada made up of three different factions does battle over a major German city, everyone sees it, but then it fades away and Roswell becomes the gold standard? The sky is full of things flying around, and I'm telling you firsthand, they're not all us. Do I believe in false flags? Seriously? 
Most of the American empire, I mentioned earlier, is based on massive false flag events. The Maine, the Alamo, Pearl Harbor, the Gulf of Tonkin... Things like Sandy Hook are just a blip by comparison. Am I being insensitive by making light of children dying at Sandy Hook? Not at all. I just can't take it seriously until someone addresses at least one of the three massive plot holes. The first is Robbie Parker smiling and laughing on camera before his CNN press conference the day after. Just look up Robbie Parker laughing, you'll understand. The second is the perfect kill ratio. Remember that I love statistics and every mass shooting has a dead and wounded column. And the interesting thing is that the wounded almost always outnumber the dead. And in exactly one case, the wounded number was zero. That case is, of course, Sandy Hook. Every person that was touched by a bullet died. Hit in the shoulder, dead. Hit in the ankle, dead. You see, I shoot, and that's a problem for me, because it's reported that the shooter fired over 150 times. Where did all the other bullets go? What you're telling me is that either the shot was always fatal or always a total miss. That has never happened in the history of mass shootings. And then there is my challenge, which has been out there for at least three years now. A thousand dollars to your PayPal account if you can show me a 10 second video of a child being carried out of that school by law enforcement. First one wins, but I'll warn you now, it doesn't exist. The whole operation went sideways because they forgot about the traffic helicopters which showed up on the scene immediately, bypassing the roadblocks. They hovered for hours while no one came out of the school. Do you know how long it would take to evacuate 600 grade schoolers? Forever. We saw none of it. So yes, even regional events can be false flags. And I think none of them are what they first appear to be. Do I believe in Bigfoot? How could I not? In 2015, we finally discovered a six-foot-tall chimpanzee species called the Billy Ape. How did it stay hidden for so long? Because it's really gun-shy of humans. And this is just one of many hidden species that are out there. It's called cryptozoology. And it's stunning to me that science still takes the same stance even today. Before the giant panda was discovered, science said it was a myth. Same goes for the giant anaconda. Same goes for the giant squid. The giant squid, by the way, is the apex predator of all time. The great white shark is just a fish and the giant squid runs them down and drags them to the bottom with almost no effort. How about the Loch Ness Monster and others out there in various lakes? All the actual dinosaurs died out millions of years ago, right? Look up the coelacanth fish. That's C-O-E-L-A-C-A-N-T-H. Dead at least 70 million years, but they are swimming all around Africa. That's just one fish, and it blows away everything we know about the carbon dating system, which I think was weak to begin with. Heck, I even believe in what I call the Goliath Cobra, a species of snake that is not only very large, but very fast. And I think explorers over the years have discovered it from time to time. But being an apex predator, the explorers didn't live long enough to make the log in their notebook. It's possible, and you know it. Not all adventure stories have a happy ending. What else can I lay on you? Might as well address vaccines. Am I against all medicine? No. Do I understand corporations and how they protect their own interests? Yes. Did I notice that the autism rate in the United States went from 1 in 10,000 to 1 in 40? You bet I did. What's causing it? Doctors don't know, and the media does not want to talk about it. It can't be the air or water or food because all those things are regional, especially food. Many parents whose children have gotten the MMR vaccine report a high fever convulsions followed by different levels of autism. Who do you think the main suspect is? For me, it's MMR. I don't care if the media runs big pharma stories saying there is no connection. The families that are being destroyed want answers and you would better give them something. Shrugging your shoulders on camera and saying it's not the vaccine, but something unknown, and that's not going to convince anyone. And while we're in this arena, let's wind down with what we're in the middle of right now. The very latest conspiracy, otherwise known as the so-called pandemic. It's a PSYOP, disguised as a medical emergency. 
The mortality rate is lower than household accidents, and yet the media has convinced most of the industrialized world to close shop. We've done entire shows dedicated to the virus, and honestly, it's just part of something bigger. Let's just call this one a work in progress. There are lots and lots of conspiracies out there, more than can be covered here. Some people believe in forest fairies and others think that Elvis is still alive. I'm not convinced, but I can't just shoot them down right away. How can I? I've been doing this flat earth thing for the last five years. I do think it's interesting though that Elvis made 33 movies in his career. See what I did there? Conspiracies all around us. I've always tried to focus on the ones that affect the most people. I look at the Dow Jones, the Nasdaq, the S&P 500, and see one big game of dice. The real objective value of our entire economy is tied to how many barrels of oil we have left. And that number is one of the great kept secrets. Good luck finding it. Or that the Soviet Union collapsed a few years after Chernobyl, and the United States said we just pressured them into disbanding. Capitalism wins. Communism loses. Chernobyl was the most expensive accident in history, and the USSR ran out of money trying to contain it. But hey, we're the US, and we rarely let an opportunity like that go to waste. Eventually it comes down to this. The world you live in is built on deception. You know it's there in business, politics, sports, entertainment, journalism, science. But we all choose to believe what our comfort zone allows. We don't want to believe strange things because they are too scary, or too big, or often just too real. Some stories take the shine off of life. I agree, sometimes objective reality sucks. For me, I try to find the silver lining. I find all of this interesting, which, let's face it, is almost always better than boring. So those are just some of the things I believe. I'll end this rant with a familiar quote from a Scottish author who sums up the silver lining of all conspiracies. That it makes life more complex, more rich, and far more interesting. I'm sure you've heard it. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive.